those days, Caesar Augustus made a law. And it required that a list be made of everyone in the whole Roman world. So Joseph went also. He went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. And that is where Bethlehem, the town of David, was. Joseph went there because he belonged to the family line of David. He went there with Mary to be listed. Mary was engaged to him, but she was expecting a baby. While there, the time came for the child to be born, but there was no guest room where they could stay. She gave birth to her first baby, a boy. She wrapped him in large strips of cloth, and then she placed him in a manger. And there were shepherds living in the fields out nearby, and it was night, and they were taking care of their sheep, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. It will bring great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Here is how you'll know I'm telling the truth. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, and lying in a manger. Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, he's with all of us. He's with us here and now. He's with us all of the time. And that's what it is that we celebrate at Christmas. The fact that God said, I will never leave you. I will never, ever abandon you. It means that you don't have to face anything in 2018 by yourself. You can, but you don't have to. Because God says, I will be with you. And when God is near, it removes your fear. You don't have to worry, because when God is near, like in the story, he says, do not be afraid. What he has for us is good news. The story of the first Christmas is really one of my favorite Christmas stories. I love it. It captures the moment in time when hope entered into the world and the shepherds and the angels and the world rejoiced. But this story and the truth of what it is that God did for us is still continuing today. Today and every day stories are still being told. Stories of God bringing hope to the struggling bringing healing to the broken and love to the lonely. And today, here are three of those stories. I just struggled to find my, my way in life, but never really knew that I needed God or that he was going to be the answer to my dilemma. I feel for myself to describe when God first showed up, I have to describe when he left. The moment that I knew I needed God was about four years ago. I was raised a Christian. I left my relationship with Christ when I was about 13 or 14. Part of what culminated in all of this was that uh, when I was six years old, my mother had attempted to jump off a bridge in Ontario and was committed to a mental institute for uh, four years at which, so from age six to 10, I was in the orphanage going back home to my father's place in Ontario and being raised by a single parent, it, uh, you know, my life by the time I was 16 or 17 was quite confusing for me. And uh, my dad, uh, having been in the Second World War, when he came out, he was pretty messed up. And he was uh, quite abusive, liked to drink a lot. And um, so all of that played into my development as a, as a young man. And when I was 16, I was pretty much uh, confused and mixed up and um, angry at my dad and not knowing my mom and, um, and I had a lot of lies I believe that uh, 
my dad would always refer to me, you're going to be like your mom, and you're useless, and you're worthless, and you'll never amount to anything. And by 17 or so, I ran into trouble, ran afoul of the law. Uh, actually, eventually spent a year in prison, and then got paroled. And just started hitchhiking across the country, over to California, and back to Ontario, and to BC, and and back and getting involved with drugs. I grew up in a Christian household. I spent most of my free time in a, the basement of a church when I was a kid. Until sixth grade, I went to school in, in the basement of my church, a school that my mother had started. And I was basically steeped in religious culture from the beginning. But, but that changed from from my early teens, I started to explore the unknown. I remember it distinctly when, when he left my life. I was in grade 10. I had a psychedelic experience, and it was only a few minutes, but it felt like hours. And in those moments, I realized everything I had ever believed, everything I had ever known was not true. And I was at a loss for words because my entire foundation for everything had shattered within a few minutes. And it was from that time on that I began to build myself anew through the perspective that I was going to push the, push the envelope, that I would challenge assumptions and perspectives, beliefs, and that's really when I started to familiarize myself with the occult, the unknown, the, the great mystery. As a means to, I, I believe I was seeking wholeness through whatever path or tradition or spiritual practice came my way. I really felt I was seeking wholeness, seeking truth. I really believe that I'm a seeker of truth. And so I sought whatever means necessary to achieve that. The moment that I knew I needed God was about four years ago. I was raised a Christian. I left my relationship with Christ when I was about 13 or 14. I had a relationship with God, which then turned into me stepping back and my parents throwing rules and regulations at me instead of the love of Christ. So it became this relationship that sucked to have God in my life when I could go and be with my friends and party and have fun. I started to feel really empty and really hollow and knew that I needed something again to fill that void. I didn't think it was Christianity based on the fact that I'd walked away from that as a teenager. I found Reiki, crystal healing, and the New Age movement, and I thought, this is it. This is, this is real stuff. It made me feel loved. It made me feel full again. And I saw healing happen, so I truly believed that it was of God. Now I know that it wasn't. The moment when I felt God show up in my life was pretty profound. Um, it was about a year and a half ago. And I'm a pretty calm and even person, and I just started to experience severe anxiety out of nowhere. Anxiety attacks multiple times a day, couldn't get a handle on it, was missing work. So I'm trying the Reiki healing, and I'm paying for it, and the crystals, I'm carrying them around. I'm smudging myself, I'm using tarot cards, and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The anxiety attacks are becoming more frequent and more prolonged. And one day I came across an article from a group called The Last Reformation that was Reiki healer, Reiki practitioner healed by Jesus. This was on my Facebook news scroll. I'd never heard of this group. I was not affiliated with them in any way. It just popped up. So I watched the video and it was quite astounding um, seeing this woman have Jesus show up in her life. So I thought, what do I have to lose? So I prayed to Jesus to just take this anxiety away from me. And immediately, 
I felt peace and my closet door slammed shut. There was no windows open, there was no fans on. My closet door just slammed shut and I felt a peace like I'd never felt before. Um, it was astounding and I still feel that peace today. I have not had another anxiety attack in a year and a half. Uh, God really showed up and really just made himself super clear to me that he was the truth and the light and there was no other way except through him. And this one particular day I was meditating deeply on my couch in Victoria, BC and I felt the presence of God overcome me. And I was so taken aback because that was the last thing I was seeking in those moments of silence and solitude. And it was the God of my forefathers, the God of my parents, the God of the Bible, the God of my childhood, but it wasn't my God and it hadn't been my God for so many years. I was baffled that that this father had come to me and and I started to cry because I felt that this was a profound moment in my life that from this moment on everything was going to change. Came to a place finally when I was uh, hitchhiking from uh, Vancouver to Mission BC, our car had blown up on the Vancouver Bridge. This guy picked us up and uh, through his actions and uh, kindness of uh, helping me find a job and helping me get a place to live and uh, even for getting dishes for us and uh, all sorts of things and that going out of his way to love us, that was the defining moment for me of knowing that I needed, I needed Christ in my life. I needed light. It, before that, I was kind of compared to like I was a flashlight, but I didn't know that I needed batteries to shine. And so uh, having, going through this little booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws, and saying the prayer at the end, um, nobody had to convince me that I was a sinner. I, done so many things that I'm ashamed of and embarrassed about and without making that decision I knew at 24 that I would be dead and Jesus was the something I needed that I didn't know and I didn't know that saying that prayer at the end of the little booklet would have such a profound effect in my life and make such a change doctors told me a year after I got saved when they saw me, my whole physical appearance was different. I had changed so much from this emaciated, drug-ridden, you know, uh, confused person that uh, Christ made such a change in my life. and delivered through the power of the Holy Spirit. That was one of the most profound moments of my life. I, I made a commitment to follow Jesus and such freedom has entered my life since then. And it's been through that deliverance that I am now starting to realize how much I need God. God has had to peel all the layers back in order for me to understand how much I need Him. As the pieces of my old life are being laid to rest, I'm realizing that there is nothing that I can do without Jesus. Sure, I can accomplish goals, I can work towards visions I have for my life, but Nothing I could do would be compared to what God has planned for me. That moment has changed my life in so many ways. Um, I was baptized about a year and a half ago, not long after that. 
I now know what it is like to be loved and to give love from a place that's not depleting but constantly replenished. I know what it's like to truly forgive people from the depth of your soul and I know what it's like to be forgiven. When I was baptized, obviously, my family was stoked. They've been waiting a long, long time for that. They never stopped praying for me. And in that moment, I truly felt like I got set free. The love, the forgiveness, the healing, all of it wrapped into one happy little dunk. That was a really cool day. And it didn't stop there. The, the healing happens every single day. I'm not a perfect person still. I still have many things to work on, but in a day-to-day, -day, he helps me work on them instead of feeling like I have to do it alone. We're not doing it at all and living with it. I love that verse that says, He is for forgiven much, loves much. Because there's a lot of stuff I did that I never wanted to bring up or deal with and you know it took years to uh, even though getting saved that uh, there was uh, a backwash of things that I had to work through and God took the time and the process to to do that it was a healing of uh, you know not just physical but healing of of lies and hurts over the years that I've received, uh, things that I believed, and uh, you know, and getting rid of those thoughts, and finding out who I was in Christ and what He thought of me. He's done a lot, but it is a process. I'm not done. Under construction, you know, work not finished. Anybody? Yeah, me too. I'm glad I'm not alone. Uh, let's give a clap for those folks who are willing to share their story. It takes a lot of courage to be able to do that because we are all under construction. But the great news is, the good news is that the angels were talking about even earlier when I was reading that story is that God is on our side. He wants you to win in life. He wants you to succeed. Later on in his life, Jesus kind of put it this way. He said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. So many people I know, though, are just a little leery of God. They're like a little afraid of when the God stuff begins to be talked about. Maybe you get nervous when people start talking about God. You know why? I do, because I've experienced it in my past. It's because sometimes when the God stuff begins being talked about, I start to feel this weight, this guilt. I start to feel like I'm a little fearful of God. I think, well, if I get close to God, I mean, he's going to let me have it, right? I mean, the weatherman is calling for a 100% chance likelihood of lightning if I interact with God. Or you're thinking, man, he's just going to remind me of all the terrible stuff that I've done. All, all the bad stuff is just going to be up in my face. And who wants to be confronted with that? But Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save it. He, came, he didn't come to slag you. He came to save you. He is God with us, but he is also God for us. And that is good news. That he is for us. He's for you. And if God is for us... Who can be against you? I, I kind of like to think about it like this. If God likes me, and I like me, if you don't like me, what's your problem? <laughs> hey? When you are confident of who it is that God is in you, there is no fear. It's just like, yeah, this is me, warts and all. I like them. God likes them. Get used to them. 
Jesus came to save us, not scare us. That's why the first words that came out of the angel's mouth that I read earlier were, do not be afraid. In fact, did you know that those are actually the first words that whenever God shows up on the scene in the Bible, those are almost always the first words out of his mouth. Don't be afraid. Don't freak out. Don't be fearful. But I can remember before I gave my life to God fully, um, I would hate talking about God with my dad. My dad became a Christian when I was about 12 years old. And whenever he would try to talk to me about God, I just remember feeling ugh, guilty. Like there was this, I just, I didn't like all of the stupid choices that I was making at the time. And I knew that those were something that I shouldn't be doing. And so there was just this awkwardness whenever it is that the God stuff would begin to show up. Some stupid choices that I were making uh, because of a bad attitude that I have. And really, sin, the, this idea of sin that everybody loves talking about is really just an attitude problem. That's all it is. It's, a, it's a, an attitude choice. In fact, what is the middle letter in the word sin? Do you not know? It's three letters. Figure it out right now. Uh, what is it? Okay, what is the middle letter in the word pride? You're, you're catching on quicker now. Good job. Yeah, it's an I problem that I have. It's a I want to be a left alone. I want to do what it is that I want. I don't need God. I'm just fine. Thank you very much. I know what it is that's going to make me happy, God. You don't have to interfere. I know you said certain things weren't good for me, but I'm going to just ignore you, because I can, right? So I'm going to do what I want to do with my life, uh, rather than what it is that you actually put me on earth to do. That's what sin is. It's an I problem, an I attitude. The Bible says that every one of us has that attitude at times, and it causes us, causes a separation between us and God. Um, every one of our problems in life, I don't know what it is that you're facing here this morning, but every single one of our problems in life are just because I am not hearing from God in a certain area. Sin causes all sorts of things in our life. I'm going to put a list up there. Sin causes confusion in your life. It causes guilt in your life. It causes shame in your life. It causes regret. It causes bitterness. It causes resentment. It causes grudges to pop up in our life. It causes worry. It causes fear. It causes discouragement. It causes emptiness in my life. It causes apathy where I just don't care about life anymore. It causes despair. It causes conflict between me and other people in my life. It causes anger in my life where just the slightest thing can fire me off. It causes lust. It causes frustration. Laziness begins to show up in my life. Loneliness, selfishness, eventually leading to death. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's a happy little list up there. Yay, Merry Christmas. <laughs> but every single one of my problems is as a result of me not being connected with God, me not fully understanding the truth of what it is that God has for my life in one of these areas. I'm going to do my own thing. And that attitude is holding us captive in one or more of maybe some of those things on the screen. As a result of that, Jesus said, I want to set you free. I want to release you. I want to save you from those things. From what? God doesn't want you carrying around guilt. That's why Jesus came, to pay for it all so that you might be forgiven. He doesn't want you to go around feeling guilty all the time. He doesn't want you feeling like you're shackled to one of those things on the screen. Like Joel talked about last week, he wants to set you free from pain and bitterness. If maybe you missed last week's message, you can watch all of our messages online. Go back and check it out. It was fantastic. You need to hear it. But when you resent other people, when you hold on to that inside of your heart, it is like a cancer that will begin to eat away at you. It's going to eat you alive. Bitterness hurts you, not the other person. He wants to set you free, free from people-pleasing as well, where you're always worried, oh, what is it that other people will think? He wants to set you free from the burden of anxiety and stress. He wants to set you free from the fear of death. 
God doesn't want you wandering around with all of these burdens. He came to set us free. That's why it is that we celebrate Christmas. It's a good thing. Yet some of us aren't living like it. God doesn't want you wandering around life with this weight. Recently, uh, a group of people went out on the streets and they did one of those like, kind of like videos of where it is that people were at. And they went out and they interviewed people and they asked them this question, what do you need to be saved from? It's kind of a weird question, but we got some great answers. Uh, and here's what it is that they heard. From spending too much money on the holidays. How many of you are wishing you'd been saved from that just a little bit right now? Yeah, some of, only one of you. The rest of you are like, no, that doesn't come till January. <laughs> My wrinkles. How many of you have a few more of those? <laughs> just me. Wow. All right. Uh, some people need to be saved from their student loans. How many of you feel the weight of that still? Yeah. Uh, how many, how about debt? Any of you guys debt involved in your life? Yeah, full of liars in this room because statistics tell us that Canadians are more in debt now than they have ever been in the history of Canada. Congratulations, everyone. How about my own inadequacies? Any of you have any inadequacies? Just me again? You just all... Yeah, just sit there in your lies. I don't care. I'll just be up here on my own, just owning it. I hate you. How about you want to be saved from school? Yeah? Oh, yeah, no. Social media? Any of you want to be saved from social media? Some of you. The rest of you are like, no, I dig it. That's awesome. How about overeating is a big one this Christmas? Why are you guys staring at me right now? That's hurtful. Turn your eyes away. He's going to figure it out. <laughs> From my vices, any of you have vices? Some of you just kind of like... How about from myself? Man, I identify with that one. I can relate to that one. I need to be saved from myself. And most of the people in the video uh, that we looked at mentioned they're still a work in progress. And all of them have grown up enough to figure out this. We are our own biggest problem. I am my biggest problem. Often we cause the biggest problems in our life. We create them ourselves. I certainly do. In many ways, I need to be saved from myself. But what do I mean by that? There are certain things in my life that I just don't like about me, and I'd like to change them, but I can't. Not on my own power, and you probably can't either. I need a savior from myself. I, there, are, there are things that I would like to be different in my life. Man, I wish I did this differently. Or man, I just wish I wasn't struggling with this. Or man, I just wish this problem would go away. I wish I acted differently like this. I wish I said this differently. But I can't change those things on my own. I've tried. I need an outside power source. Some of you say, well, I can't change. I can change these things. I can do it. No, you can't. I love you, but no, you can't. If you could, you would, but you can't, so you won't. And a week or so, you are going to make all of these New Year's resolutions uh, that by the end of January will likely be in the dumpster. That's what it is that statistics tell us. Or you're just so apathetic that you've given up trying to change anything. And you're just living a life of, ah, blissful ignorance. I love it. Just keeping things the same. I love my mess around me. I like to wade in it. I'm okay with it. Why try to change? I can't. I've tried it. I'll just be dysfunctional me. And yet deep down, there is something inside of you that would love to be just a little bit different. But you need God's power. You need a Savior. And what better day than Christmas Eve where we celebrate the birth of a Savior to acknowledge that I need saving? So let's stand this morning, and for those of you who want to pray with me, you can. Those of you who don't, that's okay, but can I just get everybody to stand up? Can I be real honest with you this morning? Some of you are looking for a Savior in the wrong places. That's why you're so frustrated. Uh, you're looking for that thing that's going to give you fulfillment and meaning and peace in life. Oh, if I could just get married, then I'd have peace. <laughs> I'm 
talk to somebody who's married, okay? Oh, if I, if I could just get the right job, if I could just get the right promotion, if I, could, if I just had more money, oh man, then everything would be great. If we could just have a baby, then everything would be great. If my babies would just grow up and graduate and leave the house, then everything would be great. But if you are expecting that to save you from where it is that you're at, you're looking in the wrong place. Instead, today you have an opportunity for a life-changing moment that could affect you for eternity. It is one where you choose to turn away from that attitude of sin, that attitude of I, that attitude of selfishness, living for yourself. And instead, make a choice to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, to believe that he is the hope and savior that we celebrate at this Christmas season. That 2,000 years ago, he came to us as a humble child, he didn't stay that way. He grew up. He showed us how to live a life of freedom. He showed us how to live a life of fulfillment, of destiny. This morning may be truly the most important opportunity, the most important moment in your life where you finally get to a place where you realize you need God, where you pause for just a moment inside of the craziness of this season and you do something completely counterintuitive where you lay down yourself and you just accept the gift that God sent us 2,000 years ago and invite Jesus into your life just the way you are. He'll accept you just the way you are. You take a moment to pause and realize that what it is that you've been doing isn't working for you and there are more things on that list that I had up there earlier than you would like to see. I need to be saved from myself. I was made by God, and I was made for God. And until you understand that, life is never going to make sense. So if you want to, join me in prayer. Lord God, please forgive me for sometimes making it all about me. This life is not about me, and I recognize that that I was created for something different, something special, something meaningful. And Father, I come to you at this moment and say, please forgive me. Please forgive me for making it about me. Please forgive me for my sin attitude. I want it to go away. I recognize that that can only happen by laying down me. I'm the biggest problem in my life. And instead, making it about you. So God, I want to invite you into my life. I want to invite you into my life today. And I want to invite you into my life every day as I wake up, recognizing that I cannot do this thing called life on my own. I need you. I need a savior. Please save me right now in Jesus' name. I recognize that what it is that Jesus did is he came, he lived a perfect life, he laid down that life, was tortured for my stupid choices so that I might, just by believing in him, be able to spend eternity with you doing amazing things in heaven. That is great news. And that is the good news of Christmas. Father, I welcome that to my life. In Jesus' name, amen.